Joining us, Andy Ock, author of Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. And the First Ladies man joins us to talk about some of those First Ladies who have quietly been changing society's views uh, and what they should be, what they thought they should be. Some of the notables in the book, Louise Adams, Lucy Hayes, Nellie Taft. One of my favorites is Mrs. Coolidge, Grace yeah. Coolidge, a suffragette. And I, I, I got to read the promotional material. I haven't yeah. seen the book yet. It looks very cool. Yeah. I mean, I, it, I'm interested in reading the book. They, they affect, you know, obviously, like a wife and a husband yeah. in a relationship. They affect the relationship. Andy, how are you? Hey, it's good to talk to you guys. How are you all this evening? We're very doing well. all right. So, so you know, you've meant, I've got a couple of notables from your book that I mentioned here, but I want to ask about one of my favorites because of her role in the suffragette movement. She pushed Calvin Coolidge right. heavily for women's rights and uh, worked alongside with women like Henrietta Wells Livermore and others. Uh, Mrs. Coolidge, Andy, what about her? Well, Grace Coolidge is actually one of my favorites, you know, the the – the, the amazing thing that sort of drew me to Grace and Calvin in the beginning was the story of how they met. And it's one of these stories you read in history books and you think it's too good to be true. It was in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, where neither of them were from, and it was sort of a chance cross-meeting at the Clark School for the Deaf, where Grace was teaching uh, uh, deaf uh, students, which was very, very ahead of her time and progressive for that type of thinking. And Calvin was a young lawyer who was working for an uncle or, 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 or cousin or something like that in Northampton, and he rented a room there at the school, and they sort of saw each other, and their eyes met across this courtyard. And I thought, well, this is, this is, this is too good to be true, but the school still exists. It's not a school, but the building is there. And they document where Grace lived in the, in the building and where Calvin did rent this room. And I stood there with my camera and looked across this courtyard, and it really could have happened that way. And that's one of the things during my travels that for each of these women, they sort of stepped off the pages or out of the oil paintings and became real. And one of these romanticized stories through the history books, it could have happened that way. It really could have happened that way just with the proximity of the two of their rooms. So she, she kind of, just the fact that, 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 that this story was, was something that I could visualize and sort of walk through the steps on made her very appealing to me beyond the things that you mentioned and beyond the influence she had over her husband's uh, administration. All right, Rick Unger's here in the studio with us. Andy, you know Rick, and of course, you know, full disclosure, Andy's one of our Fox guys. Ah, his family, he's family, so a co-Foxy. We, we take care of family here on this yeah. show. Uh, he talks about former, uh, he was chief of staff for uh, Laura Bush, and I thought she was in for the modern times one of the most re. I, I say she was a great. She was a great first lady. Great first lady. Uh, I met her when she came to the Women's National Republican yeah. Club. Actually, Andy at the in the room where I was co-chair of the Henrietta Wells Livermore School of Politics. So I had an affinity for Titan Calvin Coolidge, Grace Coolidge, Henrietta Wells, Henrietta Wells Livermore, and Laura Bush's portrait, which now hangs uh, right there in the room. Uh, she was someone who just was as clean as they get. You know, it's funny, uh, Andy, I'll be curious if you agree with this. Presidents are no different than anybody else. We are all, in certain ways, judged by our wives. And I honestly, I don't say this facetiously. I mean, I wasn't a great fan of George Bush as a president, and that's not a secret. But I thought that Laura said a lot about George Bush. Yeah. I really did. I mean, I thought that this this said, okay, there is a lot to like about this man, even if I don't agree with him, because his wife is extraordinary. And Andy, the effect she had on him, if you read his memoirs about their relationship, what do you say to that and that effect on President Bush and on the nation? Well, a lot. And it's it's not uncommon for these women to have greater poll numbers than their husband. And a lot happened in the Bush administration that was polarizing. They pulled a lot of people in a lot of different ways, like him, uh, dislike him, agree, disagree. But when you've got someone as classic and as classy as Laura Bush, who's not out, not, not boastful, not overly spoken, it's almost like a quiet grace that she gets so much done. She's one of the most well-traveled first ladies and did so much for women's rights and even shifted from her librarian type status and the and the literacy campaigns and things like that after 9/11 she really stepped up to the plate as much as anyone else in shifting her entire way of thinking her entire causes and started traveling to these locations where these women were oppressed and doing amazing things for the women in these regions. I had the good fortune of meeting Laura Bush around the time of the malaria summit in December of 2006. 
She could not have been nicer. She could not have been more polite, more gracious, more uh, affable. I, she was just a, a, a really, she was a stabilizing factor to an administration that through no fault of, of George Bush, like him or, or dislike him, there's a lot of stuff that happened. We had space shuttle incidents. We had uh, uh, 9-11, of course, is, is the biggest thing that led to the, to the, to the wars. And, and that, will, that will tear a country in, in, and make divide. And, and Laura Bush was a stabilizing factor for that. In fact, there's a painting that was given to Laura Bush on the morning of 9-11. It was given to her by Ted Kennedy. He had painted it himself, and it's a little bit tarnished now because they had to dust it for anthrax and a bunch of other stuff, but they took it out of her hand on the morning of 9-11, and that now is at the Bush uh, 43 Library in Dallas, which is a beautiful, beautiful library. And, um, and Laura Bush really, really, uh, she was that stabilizing factor and, and gave him that sort of likability, even in circles where he wasn't terribly well-liked. The book is unusual for their time, First Lady's Man on the Road with America's First Lady. Uh, you mentioned something there, and I, I, it just occurred to me, and I, I have a couple of little nuggets, and one of them is probably listening right now, <laughs> Andy, is that Catherine, uh, who is a friend of mine out there in Texas, was in 4-H with Laura. And in the 90s, and I'm going back to about 94, 96 in that era, I was doing the literacy program with Barbara Bush and Rudy Tomjanovich in my time in Houston. I was one of the people that was out there as a spokesman for them. She, the librarian, as you say, Laura Bush, picked up from uh, someone who was a very beloved first lady, Barbara Bush. Absolutely. And you know, one of the most fascinating things about Barbara Bush is that from the time she met George H.W. Bush, she has been keeping scrapbooks, physical scrapbooks, big scrapbooks, hundreds of pages in hundreds of scrapbooks. And at the library, they have these. She continues to make them to this day. And you can really get a look at a family. And this is another time when these people become real. Because you can imagine sitting back with your family, your mom, your brothers and sisters, uncles, grandparents, flipping through pages of, of that card, that 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 um, that, that stick. Uh, colored paper that, that is in traditional photo albums with, with actual photographs, physical pieces of paper taped in there with handwritten notes and newspaper articles. And you can see the entire Bush family goofing around, wearing funny hats at Christmas time, or making, you know, making, you know, pulling on a, a wishbone at Thanksgiving. Uh, Barbara Bush, in some of the happiest times of her life, when she was in China with her husband, where she got to kind of step out of that limelight. But talk about a woman who is the glue that holds a family together. That is the stabilizing and strongest force of the entire Bush family. Everyone knows it. Everyone looks up to her. But you get to see some of these things with the access. When I travel to all these locations, every library, every museum, every house, every train station that relates to every first lady, Martha Washington, through Michelle Obama, with the good name of C-SPAN behind me with a series that I was good fortunate to be part of the production team, there was no door left unlocked, no vault that was closed. C-SPAN's good name got me all access passes to some of the greatest collections uh, in, in, in American history. Andy Ock is my guest, First Ladies Man. Good title for a book, mm -hmm. by the way. Good. I like that. It kind of catches your eye. Uh, you know, on the road with America's First Ladies. I, I want to go back in history. Actually, let's go to Michelle Obama. You mentioned Michelle Obama. I want, actually, and I also want to talk about Mrs. Cleveland. I, Mrs. I read Cleveland. up about Francis her. I Cleveland. thought that was fascinating. All right. Oh, so, sure. We can, talk, we can talk about all of them. That's, that's it. I tell you, Martha to Michelle. All right. So let's talk about Michelle Obama, the current First Lady. Uh, education background. This is someone with a professional background. And again, I put the politics aside. What about her effect on uh, the White House? Is it too early to tell would be my first question, because you tend to get these things like presidents in hindsight. It, it, it is a little bit too early to tell. I mean, she has the obvious legacy of being the first African-American first lady. There are things that are going to follow her through time and history that can't be removed and shouldn't be removed, no matter who you are or whether you like her or dislike her. She has taken an unusually, um, I, I, I guess the, the word for it is she has taken a, a less political role than I thought she might have given some of the other first ladies, Hillary Clinton would obviously come to mind, with uh, women that have 
these uh, uh, higher degrees of education. They, they've been very active before the White House in policy in their husband's lives. And, and so to see her getting out and doing things like making a garden and worrying about child obesity, her thing, you know, that is a very, uh, it is a more traditional cause and more traditional role of a first lady than I would have expected. I would have really thought she was going to go out and start hammering some policy and, and, and being that lawyer, that advocate for her husband. But she has taken a, a more first lady, uh, for lack of a better term, a, a more wifely role and, and, and keeping, the, um, keeping the, the, the lives and, and images of her, of her family and her daughters very intact, similar to like an Edith Roosevelt would have done back in the day to control a very, very hungry press, press and media. We love these children in the White House. And, Rick, you were saying earlier with, with the Clevelands, I mean, Frances Cleveland was Jacqueline Kennedy yeah, before Jacqueline exactly. Kennedy. exactly. She's the youngest first lady to ever be in the White House. Right. She was 21 years old when she married 49-year-old Grover yeah. Cleveland, President Cleveland. Can you imagine? And when they had yeah. in the White <laughs> to House. this day and age, what the stories that would oh, run? Oh, you oh, imagine? Yeah, I, I, no, I, I was just thinking that. What would a 21-year-old wow. marry in uh, the president? <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Well, imagine imagine a bachelor coming into the presidency yeah. nowadays. Not yeah. That, that, that would even be. Or, you know, what Woodrow Wilson did. I mean, Edith Wilson is the, the country's first female president. Edith yeah. Wilson ran the country she while did. Woodrow Wilson was recovering from a stroke. And what Woodrow Wilson told the country was, or what his people told the country, his staff was, the president's tired. He needs to rest for a few months. <laughs> and, yeah. and the Congress and the country, everyone just accepted it. I mean, if we don't see President Obama every day, we start to lose our minds a little bit. Where is he? What's he yeah. doing? He's on vacation. He's slacking. Any president, any modern day president. He's playing golf. And Woodrow Wilson, this is, this is, I've read the letters. I've seen the letters. I've held the letters in Stanton, Virginia at the Wilson Library. President Wilson and his doctor had planned for Wilson to retire. He was going to go to Congress and say, I'm out, guys. I'm very sick and I can't handle this. In a letter that Wilson's doctor writes, to a staff member, he says, President Wilson's plan to retire does not please Mrs. Wilson. She stepped in and wouldn't let him retire. She felt that if he didn't have the presidency to kind of keep him going and keep him alive, he would just kind of fall out and oh, wither away. Anyway, yeah, she was looking out so, for her yeah, husband. Looking out for him. Yeah. You know, so that, exactly. That's the, you know, that is the number one rule, and there's no one better that you can point to than Nancy Reagan, who would, right. who would be yeah, the I advocate think that, that for it. her husband's legacy. I mean, even before the Alzheimer's, the first book she writes out of there is to kind of debunk some of the myths and, and, and misgivings that have been associated with the, with the Reagan administration. You know, Andy, I thought one of the other interesting things that you did, uh, and I was surprised by how interested I was in it, is you point out a lot the relationship that the first ladies allowed between the public and their children. And, and it was fascinating because we do have this fascination with the first family and the kids in the first family right. and how each one took a different approach to it. It's remarkable. I mean, the, 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 um, the Cleveland administration got so – we, we've all read the stories that, that back in the day, before Secret Service, before all the fences, all the gates and, and, and the modern-day stuff that we have to deal with, the, the White House really was the public's house. We hired the president, as we still do, but you could walk in and out and yeah. have meetings with the president. You could, it was like a revolving door. It was like walking in and out of a hotel. And at events there, people would tear off pieces of cloth. People, they would take curtains. They would take silverware. They would take souvenirs. And it was just un, uh, unregulated. And access. they would pick up their children when they were babies out of their carriages well, yeah. and hold them. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly exactly the point you did you did you did look into this yeah. that's exactly the point the clevelands were so popular and francis was so popular and so young and so pretty and so fashionable but the children the cleveland children would be out in the yard with the nannies and things like that and people would walk up and grab them from the arms of the nannies to take pictures yeah can you imagine that it was a simpler time you know andy i, I want to wrap up with one of the first lady and it's funny because you sure. mentioned a time when you know fences and, and things were different at the white house mary todd lincoln Yes. Fascinating woman. Really fascinating to me. On many levels. You know, the most amazing thing that I found out about her was when I was at her childhood home in Lexington, Kentucky. We don't think about Mary Todd. We always think about Mary Todd Lincoln. And there's a fact. She never went by Mary Todd Lincoln. That is modern. 
all of the books that she took with her to the White House. When she was married, she became Mrs. Abraham Lincoln or Mary Lincoln or Mrs. President Lincoln. There are no autographs, no books, nothing that comes from her in her hand that says Mary Todd Lincoln. But when you go back to Mary Todd, she had an amazing childhood. She did lose her mother very early and had a stepmother. This is kind of, you know, the whole Disney story, evil stepmother, and she didn't get along. And we read letters and diaries where Mary didn't get along with her stepmother. In modern times, what teenage girl gets along with her mother? Or yeah, her I think that's yeah. kind of natural. <laughs> You know, fairly natural. But what teenage girl gets access to a very prominent father and at the time, in the, in the 1800s, gets to sit in with extremely important people of the day, political greats, genius minds of, 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 the, of the early days, the pre-Civil War days, in, in massive in major issues like, like uh, uh, slavery and, and, and possible colonization. And she, she, from a very, very young age, is welcomed into the circles of men and men. She was very well read. For, yes. for a very woman of small stature, she carried a large presence. You know, Andy, David and I are sitting here as you're talking, and we're nodding at each other and going, this is really cool stuff. Yeah, this is. I mean, it, and it takes you away from what we normally hear about, you know, the White House and about yeah. politics. This is great. Yeah. It, it, I will read this book. Well, you know, it's interesting, guys, and you bring it up. And what we know collectively as, as a public about these women is typically what they did in the White House. Some, some, of course, after the White House and their causes that go on and women that live for, for considerable amount of time after their husband, like Lady Bird Johnson, way outlives her husband. Uh, uh, best. I actually met her. Kinds. She's one of the first ladies really? I met. I met Lady Bird in Austin. That's cool. Yeah, I, I met one of her uh, one of her social secretaries that used to bring guests out to the ranch. Letitia, an amazing woman, amazing woman. But what we know about these women is from their time in the White House. So I wanted to, of course, we had to get into that. But it was very, very important to me to know who were the young girls, the young women, the new wives, the mothers, what they did outside of the White House, before the White House, and after the White House. Because those are the real stories when we get the real people a little bit outside of the limelight and really dig deep and find out what the true personalities of these women were. And it was just an amazing, amazing adventure. And I'm just pleased to share it with the public uh, now in, in, in this book beyond what was in the series. Well, Andy, it's great to have you here, man. This is a very cool book. I've, it is. I've got a book, and, and Rick knows in my office upstairs, and it's The Presidents. And, yeah. I, and I'm, a, I'm a history buff, and this is going to go next to it because I like to read behind the scenes. I also like the T-shirts you have on your website, First Ladies Man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wear an com. extra large yeah, in case I, you're I, wondering. Yeah, I, I was going to say, are these fruit of size? Are they run a little small? Do they shrink? You know, let's talk. <laughs> Here, Andrew. <laughs> we'll, 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 we can get you set up with all kinds of stuff. We can you talk. Know, I should yeah. mention right now that, that, that the publishing company that I am with, Tactical 16, 50% of the profit of this book is going to help troops tell their stories oh, and write cool. their stories and Very take cool. classes and get ghostwriters. It's a fantastic group of guys and girls, women, men, veterans that have put together this publishing company. To it, We find that it helps with PTS and a lot of troops when they get to tell their story unedited in that no one tells them how to tell their story. It's doing great work and, and for these wonderful, wonderful people that allow us to live the way we live in America. Tactical 16, I can't say enough about them. And, uh, and we're, we're making sure that vets get to, their voices are heard and their stories are written by them. And, and, and that's, where, that's where a lot of this money is going to. Well, you can order the books online at firstladiesman.com. You've got some merchandise there as well. I love that. And uh, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies by Andrew Ock. Andrew, I mean, really, man, the good stuff. Good I like stuff. this. This is neat stuff. Yeah. And the fact that I think, like me, there are probably other people out there. I've just had the good fortune of literally just – you know, like touches, having met yeah. some of these first ladies, and They're it's fascinating. People, yeah, you know? they are there. All, all through my travels, I came up with that too, guy. I mean, you know, the people would see me filming at these various locations and say, oh, my dad, and still at my speeches now, I speak all over the country at presidential libraries, museums, historical societies, clubs, and, and people will come up and say, you know, my, my, my mom worked for Lady Bird, or, you know, I was in a parade and I got to shake Jacqueline's hand, or I, I knew Nancy Reagan from this and that. And, and at the, the, the locations where I went to, people always have a story, because these women, they are. They are ambassadors for their husband's uh, 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 administrations. Their job is to go out and be with the people and be personable. And, and they, they, they all do it effectively in one way or another. And, and there are a lot of those brushes 
and it's neat to talk with those people and, and pick up those stories as well. Well, I love these stories. I recommend this. I recommend this for people. It's a good read. Takes you away from this. It puts a nice look and a historic look to boot uh, at these first ladies and their effects on, frankly, their effects on the country. Because if Huge. you affect the man, uh, you can't have an effect on, on the country. Thank you, Andy. Absolutely. Thank you.